Good morning. I assume they'll adjust the volume as needed, so I'll just get up here and talk. Where does Tom usually stand when he preaches? Down here, up there, or where? Behind the communion table. Behind the communion table. That'll work for me, too. Uh, things change over time, you know. I had uh, this, this week, I had to put some duct tape on my Bible to, to keep the binding on it. But uh, this Bible here, I've had for several years, and I'm comfortable with it. I also I had another choice of Bibles at home, and that Bible showed really how things change because uh, we don't have the Green Family Bible anywhere. It got sold at auction years ago, but I do have the Brown Family Bible. So in four generations, our family changed from brown to green. <laughs> Most things go from green to brown, but uh, amongst the things of my brother gave me a while back was a picture of four generations of ladies beginning with my great grandmother green who was a weaver whose mother was a fisher whose mother was a brown so that's where it changed there so you know things change things have changed uh, quite a bit over the years since i grew up at little prairie and uh, spent my teen years here in this church, well, in that church down there, and then helped carry bricks when this church was built. I know some of the rest of you did that along with me. And, uh, you know, we can expect change. PowerPoint, yeah, that's something new. I just have to push with my finger to point to what I want to point to, and uh, I don't do the computer stuff very good there. So bear with me. There won't be anything flashing up on the screen that I know of. I'm not going to turn around and look. And, and, but if here you all laughing, I know it must be something good. So, You know, the Bible talks a lot about sheep and how we are sheep and Christ is our shepherd. And today we're going to look at a different animal. If you have a Bible, turn with me to... Uh, one of the things that changes is your vision. So we're going to do this here real quick. Change my looks. I don't know if it helps or not, but that's the best I can do. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew, the fourth chapter. I'm not as quick at turning the pages as I once was either. We're going to begin with verse 18. Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 says, Now Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that we have to gather here together. We thank you, Father, for this house of worship. We thank you for your Holy Spirit dwelling within us that makes us also your house of worship. We pray, Father, that you'll be with me now as I bring this message, that I might bring it forth in a way that it will cause people to examine their lives and draw closer to you. We ask, Father, that you be with us in this time of pandemic and be with the leaders of our governments in the decisions that they make. They might do those things which will cause your word to continue to be spread and your gospel to continue to be preached. We pray, Father, that you help us now to do what we can to reach the lost. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Growing up two miles south of here in my teen years, I have some fond memories. Some of my fondest memories are going fishing with my grandfather, Neil. We'd go to the creeks that were located near the farm there and fish. Now, Grandpa Neil, I'm beginning to understand why he did what he did. Grandpa Neil's fishing pole had a line on it and it had a bobber that was bright orange, about the size of a baseball. <laughs> and Grandpa Neil would not admit that his vision was slipping a little bit, but he did say that if the fish couldn't pull the bobber under, it wasn't worth bringing in. So. <laughs> Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Growing up around the Sea of Galilee and traveling around the Sea of Galilee, fishing was a common occupation. Fish was an important part of the food there. They used nets. These men were mending their nets. When I went fishing, I didn't use a net. I used a pole or a rod and reel. Now, I don't know, this may date some of you, but uh, as a youngster, I remember singing a song. And now, uh, we'd sing this at youth group down in the church basement a lot of times on Sunday nights. Some of you remember how that used to meet. And uh, it's related to this passage of scripture. And it's not, row, row, row your boat. <laughs> it's, I will make you fishers of men. How many of you are familiar with that song? Well, most of the people, uh, the younger people, I don't, don't think they sing quite as many little kids' songs anymore. Maybe they've got newer ones there. But anyhow, we used to sing this, and we would put actions with it. And we had updated our actions from Jesus' day. We didn't cast nets. We got out our rod and reels, and we were casting for fishers of men. So let's just take a quick time here. Stand up if you know the song and uh, do the actions if you remember those and we'll see what kind of actions I get to see all of you here. I, we're just gonna do the first verse there. I'll, I'll lead it out here. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. If you follow me. If you follow me. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at the fish, the equipment, and the technique. So let's start with the fish. The fish around the Sea of Galilee, there were probably several different varieties in there. We don't know what kind they were, but we know that fish are many and different. We also know that in that area, fish were a major source of food. They were necessary for life. They often ate fish. We know that in order for a fish to have value, it needs to be caught. A fish swimming out in the sea or in a creek or in a pond or a lake is of very little value until it's caught and put to use there. And we need to look at some of the things that Jesus had to do with fish. We know that Jesus used fish in different ways. And when we think about the fish, we don't always think about people, but uh, let's just look at it now from just the standpoint of fish there and Jesus. He was involved with fish. There was one occasion, if you remember, when uh, 
the temple treasurers ask Peter if their Lord paid temple tax. And uh, Peter had to go find out if they did. And on that occasion, Jesus told Peter to take a line and cast it into the sea. And the first fish he pulled out reach in its mouth and take out a coin. That coin was the exact temple tax for Jesus and Peter. So every April 15th, go out and cast your lines. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way for us, but at least this year they give you a little more time to do that. We know that on another occasion, two occasions actually, Jesus fed people using fish. Now, when I was a kid, we could uh, go to the fair and they had what we called fairground fish sandwiches. It was a little piece of fish with a lot of batter and a bun. And they could make that fish go a long way. My dad at one time had the recipe for the batter, but uh, in, in grilling it, cooking it out there, it didn't turn out quite like fairground fish. But there was always that little bitty fish. Well, if you remember a couple of occasions there, on one occasion, Jesus fed 5,000 men. We don't know how many women and children were in the, in the crowd that day with just five loaves and two fish. Five loaves of bread, two fish fed 5,000 people. That's a miracle, isn't it? Definitely. And there was no charge Children under three could eat free, yes. Those 12 and under, half price, nope, it was free. Adults, free. I'd like to find, uh, they don't do that at Long John Silver's. I, I know they don't, or even at Captain D's, neither one. And on another occasion, he fed 4,000 people, men, 4,000 men, with just seven loaves and a few small fish. We don't know how many, but it does say they were small. Probably couldn't even pulled under Grandpa Neil's bobber. But uh, still, he was able to perform those miracles. Yeah, Luke records a, an occasion where he assisted the disciples in catching some fish. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Now so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, which is another name for the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. That's what Luke had to say about this situation. Old Peter, he'd been a fisherman for a long time. He thought he knew how to catch fish. They'd gone out all night. Mike Mann related to us in Sunday school class this morning a story of how he went salmon fishing in the dark on Lake Michigan. And you'll have to ask him about that sometime, his experience there. But they didn't catch anything. Sometimes you don't. And so he, when the Lord tells him, put out there in the deep, well, you know, fishing may not be as good out in the deep as it is closer to shore, but they go out. And 
catch more fish than they could ever imagine. Again, another miracle. We also know that Jesus used fish in his teachings there. He told them that uh, uh, when he talked about how God gives us good things, that a father would give his son, if his son asked for uh, bread, he wouldn't give him a stone, or if he asked for fish, he wouldn't give him a serpent. Now, I know most of us would not want to sit down to a plate of serpent on our uh, dinner table and eat snake when we could have fish. And so he told them that if ordinary fathers know how to give you what's good for you, how much more does our Heavenly Father know how? He also on another occasion talked about the kingdom of heaven being like a net that was cast into the sea and all the fish are brought in and they sort them out, good from bad, which is talking about the judgment that's going to come at the end of time. So he used fish to teach. So when we think about Jesus' relationship to fish, we know that Jesus knows his fish and that Jesus uses fish. Moving on to the equipment here. If you're going to go fishing, what's the first thing you need? Anybody know? Yeah, you better have a fishing license, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or they can confiscate your boat, your trailer, your pickup truck you're pulling your boat with. More power to a conservation police officer than any other officer out there. So you better have a license. And guess what? Jesus gave a license. Jesus said, all authority is given to me on heaven and earth. Go thee therefore into all the nations. Preach the gospel to everyone. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's known as the Great Commission. It isn't just permission that allows you to fish, it's something even greater. It's something that calls you to fish. Now, that license lasts forever, whereas the others have to be renewed. But sometimes we may have to renew our commitment to going out and fishing, renew our commitment to keeping this great commission that we've been given. One of the things we always had to take with us when we went fishing was bait. Or we had to have some artificial lures. You have to have something to attract the fish, to get the fish's attention. If it's something they'll eat, they're going to be attracted to it, either from the smell or from the appearance of it. If it's imitation, artificial bait, you have to make it look and act like the real thing. Just uh, throwing it out there may not be enough. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If we're going to present Christ to people, we have to be as Christ-like in our presentation as he was. To present with love, to present with compassion, to present with humility the message of Christ. We put the bait out there. You need a hook, something to bring the fish in, catch the fish, bring it in. We have the hook of the gospel. All we have to do is tell them about the fact that Jesus was uh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, uh, preached and healed and performed many miracles, was crucified, buried, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and has promised to return to gather his faithful. You need a line and a pole, a means for bringing the fish in. Our line is one thing, it's what we say. 
We have to be able to say what we want to tell people. And we also, back when I was a kid, there was a TV show on called What's My Line? where these people would be asked questions about their occupation and from their answers they had to guess what their occupation was, their vocation or their avocation or whatever it might be. In our case, if we are going to talk the talk, we're going to need to walk the walk. We're going to, our line is going to have to be a follower of Jesus. As he said, follow me. Why is this important that we have all this? Because we're in a fishing competition, folks. It's not a, you know, who can catch the biggest, who can catch the most. It's a matter of can we get them caught before somebody else gets them caught. The old prophet Habakkuk was going through times about like we are now, and he was seeing that Wickedness seemed to be on the increase and righteousness seemed to be something that you didn't, didn't really want or was getting trampled by the wickedness of the day. And we're seeing more and more of that in today's society. In Habakkuk chapter 1, There it is. It's on page 936 in my Bible. I'm not sure where it is in yours. Beginning with, uh, oh, let's start with verse 14. If I get on chapter 1 instead of 2, I'll do better. Habakkuk here is talking to God, and he's explaining what he's seeing and just doesn't understand why it's happening. And he says right here, he says, this is, this is where we get the whole thing of this message here. Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook, referring they refers to the, the wicked, basically. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet, because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? That's the wickedness kind of wants to prevail there. So we gotta, got to uh, reach out and catch people before the wickedness and Satan take control of them because uh, it's like, uh, as it said, they're like fish caught in a cruel net there. We've looked at the fish. We've talked about the equipment you need. Now the technique. Don't matter how many fishing shows you watch on television, in most houses you're not going to catch fish in your living room. You got to go to where the fish are. We've got to go out into the world to reach out to people who are outside of Christ and to bring them to Christ. Jesus' commission said to do what? Stay home and wait for people to come to you and ask you about him? Nope. Go, go to anywhere, anywhere you go. As you're going, do those things. Preach the gospel. If uh, you don't know exactly where to go, if you're fishing some new territory, we have a guide. If you're somewhere away from here and fishing, a lot of times you'll get the services of a guide. We have a guide. We have the Holy Spirit to direct us to who we need to go to, to where we need to go to reach someone for Christ and what we need to say to them. We can rely on the Holy Spirit as our guide.
you're where the fish are, you got your equipment, you're ready to cast your line. Now, my technique was to cast the line up and out and put it out about where I wanted to put it. That's the old rod and reel method, the cane pole method. And nets, you gotta put them where the fish are too. Cast your line up and out. Talk to people. Well, first of all, before you talk to people, talk to God. Colossians chapter four. Beginning with verse 2, it says, Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Pretty much makes it plain that we, when we talk to people, first talk to God about people, about others, those you want to see brought to the kingdom, which should be just about everybody, but the ones you're particularly concerned about, mention them by name to God and have him work with the Holy Spirit to reach those people through you. Secondly, you gotta to talk to others about God. Easy to do, maybe not always. Sometimes, uh, you know, best thing you can do is just tell them your story. Do it briefly. Don't spend three hours telling them all about everything you ever did. The Apostle Paul, many times in his writings, would recount, recount the fact that as Saul of Tarsus, he was a persecutor of the church. But when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, it completely changed his life. And that's what people want to know about, how Jesus can change their life. There were others. If you remember the woman at the well, she... Uh, had a conversation with Jesus. And when she left the well and went back to the town, she told the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. And the people, because of what she said, went out to hear Jesus. The Gadarean demoniac was one after the demons were cast out he uh, wanted to go with Jesus, get in the boat and go with him, go to the other side of the, of the Sea of Galilee. But Jesus told him, no, go home to your family and friends and tell them, show them what the Lord has done for you. The blind man, the man who'd been blind from birth, Jesus said to him, or healed him, gave him back his sight. And when uh, the Pharisees saw that this guy has now had sight, they, because of Jesus, they started questioning him. What happened? What did you do? What happened? How come you can see now and you couldn't before? He said, I met a man named Jesus. He spat on the clay, put it on my eyes, told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and I received my sight when I did what he told me. They kept asking him, kept hounding him about it. They bothered his folks about it, trying to get them to say something that caused problems, but the man stuck by what he said. Let's take a look at his last response here in uh, Matthew chapter 9. It 
Sadducees were convinced that Jesus was just a, a sinner causing trouble. Matthew chapter 9. I think I've got the wrong scripture written down here. On, oh, that's the demoniac there. Well, anyhow, what he said was, I don't know if this Jesus is a sinner or not, but once I was blind, but now I can see. Simple, to the point, Jesus had given him sight. So as a result of all this, we see that we have a challenge, a challenge ahead of us. Once you've cast your line, wait for a strike, wait for them to show some interest, set the hook, lay the gospel out before them, let them know what they need to do to accept Christ as their savior, and then reel them in, bring them to Jesus. A fish is never caught until it's brought to shore. We can talk about the ones that got away, but it's always a disappointing story when we do. It's the same way when we try to bring people to Christ. I'm sure that Paul felt uh, when Felix said, almost you persuade me to become a Christian, that Paul was probably disappointed that he didn't completely convince him. But we have to spread the gospel of Christ. Fishermen like to gather around and talk and share fish stories and that type of thing. And, uh, you know, we've come to that time where we've got to find out where you're at here. If you're a fish, if you're someone, you know, this is a transformation process. It's not just going from brown to green in name. This is going from being a fish in a sea where there's some bad nets and some bad people out there, Satan using to try to trap you and catch you and keep you away from God. And you got to get out of there if you're going to survive. God said, uh, by my rebuke, the oceans dry up and the rivers become a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and they die of thirst. Nothing worse than a stinking fish, I can tell you that. I've smelled some. They're bad news. Rotten. So if you're a fish, you need to be safely on shore. You need to accept Christ. If you're a fisherman, and I'm sure many of you out there have accepted Christ, you need to be a fisher of men. Go from a fish to a fisher of men. Statistics show that those who have recently converted are more likely to bring their friends to Christ than people who have been in the church for years. As they say, uh, you know, there was a saying came out after World War II that old soldiers never die, they just fade away. There's also a saying that says old fishermen never die, they just smell that way. <laughs> we can't just sit around and talk to, about fishing. Jesus didn't say, come join my fishing club and we'll meet once a week and we'll discuss fish and fishing and uh, give you all kinds of things to help you, some advice on how to catch them. Jesus didn't say, meet me at Tilapia Pro Shop and we'll look at the latest nets and see what is out there and available for us. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And we know that those four men 
brought in a lot of fish and turned them into fishers of men. Stories told of an area that was known for its fishing, but on this particular season of the year, no one was catching any fish. I can't say no one, there was one person who'd bring in a boatload of fish every day. Nobody else could seem to catch anything. So finally, the local uh, conservation officer decided he'd go out with this guy and see where his spot was, where he was catching all these fish. And so he asked if he could go in the boat with the man. The man said, yes, get in, get into the boat. And they go out and the man gets out his rod and reel and begins to troll for fish and doesn't catch anything. Keeps it up for a while. Finally, he pulls his line in and he reaches down into his tackle box, takes out a stick of dynamite, lights the fuse, throws it out over the water. The concussion of that explosion brings a bunch of fish to the surface. He paddles his boat over, loads the fish into his boat. And the other man is just astonished at this. He, uh, you know, what, what's going on here? And he says, hey, I said, he says to him, this is wrong. This is not right. You can't fish this way. And so the man doesn't say anything. He, the fellow identifies himself. He said, I'm the conservation officer and what you're doing is totally illegal. And finally the man reaches into his tackle box and picks out another stick of dynamite lights the fuse, hands it to the man. He said, did you come here to talk or to fish? <laughs> we have available to us the explosive power of the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ. Are we going to just talk about it or are we going to follow Jesus and go fish?